Real Trees Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by RTP Outdoors, Trophy Rock, Redneck Blinds, Wilderness Athlete, Hoyman Tree Saws, Ozonics, Nikon, Easton Arrows, America's Best Bowstrings, Viking Solutions, Spot Hog Releases, Cabela's, Hoyt, Frigid Forage, Fuse, Grizzly Coolers, Drake Non-Typical, Wasp Archery, Muddy Outdoors, and Real Tree Edge, Hunt with an Edge. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. Today is February 22nd. I'm on one of the farms to check a camera. My goal today is to find out if one particular deer is still alive. Uh, it's a deer in call flyers and I'll tell you the story as I go here. But unfortunately he's injured pretty bad. And uh, I think our last picture was January 30th. He has shed both sides and uh, we've, we found one side so far. Uh, but he's in bad shape. I think he was shot during late muzzleloader season. And uh, my goal is to put out some corn and just try to find him back and see what he looks like. If he's still alive, I don't know. Like I said, he's in bad shape, but hopefully uh, he's on this camera. If not, like I said, I'm gonna put out corn and try to find him. So I'll tell you more once I get down to the spot. This is the spot that I filmed flyers this year. It was November 27th, I believe, out of this pine tree right behind me. And I had just gotten pictures of him a, a couple weeks prior, so I knew he was around. This deer actually doesn't live on this farm. He just shows up mid to late November, and he tends to stick around after that. He did the same thing this year. Um, but I killed my buck on October 27th, so all I, all I had left was the landowner tag. So I didn't have a buck tag specifically for this farm. I was just coming out to shoot a doe for a friend that wanted some meat. And uh, in the back of my mind, I was hoping to see flyers and get some footage of them. And sure enough, you know, right after daylight, flyers comes in here, uh, 25 yards. I mean, could have shot him all day long if I had a tag. But I actually saw him twice that day and uh, later that afternoon when I came out in to hunt too. There's really cool footage just, just right here in the pines. Cool footage of him, not easy to let him walk by 25 yards, but uh, he stuck around um, most of the winter here. And uh, like I said, he, he doesn't live on this farm. So there's a lot of people in the neighborhood that hunt this deer, a lot of people know about him. So there's a lot of pressure around. Um, and we actually had hunters come in and hunt this property during late muzzler season. And one of the guys actually shot at him. And we had thought he missed and we're still not uh, sure what happened but what we do know is he's injured really bad right now uh, we got pictures of him in January our last one like I said earlier is, is January 30th and uh, he's in pretty bad shape it's his left front shoulder that uh, is it just looks like uh, you know something tore him up I mean it's a big gaping wound and it's one of those wounds where he's made it at least four or five weeks. I think it happened somewhere around the first of the year. And uh, unfortunately, the thing that's gonna kill him will be infection if it, if it does. If he does die, that's probably what it'll be to do to just because the wound is so open and, and big. And uh, I don't know. I don't have a good feeling about him surviving that, especially with the weather starting to warm up and increasing that likelihood of a, of a bad infection. But I do have a, a lot of history with this deer, and like I said, it would not be good to see it end that way. Um, we did pick up one of his sheds about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Just an awesome antler, really cool color to it, good character. Um, 
still haven't found the other side but we uh hoping it's on this farm somewhere this is actually his match set from the previous year he had two matching flyers off his g2s um, and this year his other side's even bigger he grew five flyers this year so a very fitting name for him obviously but i'm gonna put out some corn right now and just see and I just hope that he's still around still alive and uh you know kind of see if it's the wound is healing up any any better at all i think january 30th it looked like there was a pus pocket forming maybe in front of the shoulder so it sucks to see and i don't have a good feeling about him surviving but um all we can do is hope and you know try to keep him around and, and monitor how he's doing so i'm gonna get some corn out in front of this camera and we'll see what happens Well, we'll see what happens. I'll probably come check that camera here in four or five days or so. It won't take long for that corn pile to disappear. Hopefully Flyers finds it. Hopefully Flyers is still alive, first of all. And uh, maybe we can find that other side here in the next couple weeks. But I'd love to continue the Flyer story into the 2018 season. That's pretty cool. This is a, a buck we call Ray. I think Mike and I saw him driving in one time, but we never actually never actually saw him while we were hunting. We were calling him a fully mature deer, you know, five plus. So we were trying to kill him, but uh, that's pretty cool. We hadn't seen him in a while, but I, I think he may have shed early. That's cool. First shed on the new farm. That's awesome. Mike and I are out here taking a walk on our new farm. It's uh, we're beginning our first off season here, so. We're talking about you know things we want to do differently and, and things we learned. You know, one thing that we know if we just pulled cards the other day, and there's really very few deer on this farm. They've moved off the winter somewhere else, and of course, a big product or big reason for that is we didn't have any food. So um, that's one thing we want to change, of course. But I mean, there are a lot of different things that we learned um, positive going forward, and you know, we we had some good hunts, but a lot of things we want to change too. Yeah, one of the major things that you know we're happy about is we have really good age structure on this farm um, throughout the hunts last year that was pretty obvious lots of mature bucks um, of course as you mentioned we got the farm late so we didn't have much food we didn't have time to put food and the deer have left and so we haven't had pictures and we probably won't have much for shed antlers but uh, you know we found one Jared found one earlier today of one of our mature bucks so really looking forward to that I'm expecting after talking with the neighbors that we should have uh, you know, a good crop of bucks for next year. And then one of our big projects, of course, is going to be to put food to hold them and then just um, increase what we learn about how deer move through here with food. Because the deer moved predictably last year, what we thought, how they would move on this farm. But I think food obviously is going to change that. Um, one of the big things when we, we got this farm, we targeted this big wooded peninsula as a major bedding area and certainly it is a lot of deer bed out there but the more we hunted the more we moved out towards this wetland area we learned that a lot of deer also bed here so it's going to be interesting to see how food changes that and um, just trying to improve our ability to hunt it because it's one giant bedding area obviously and uh, that that is a challenge sometimes mike and i kind of have a a list of probably the main projects we want to tackle this off season or going into the summer that could potentially have immediate impact this fall um, one of that Mike mentioned how good of the of bedding area the whole farm is you know both in the timber and out in the willows this spot back behind us is an example of part of the timber that's really open so I would say our number one project that we want to at least get started I don't know how much we'll be able to do this year there's some regulations because a lot of this farm is in WRP so we're still kind of working through what we can and can't do um, 
but this is an example of some of the timber that we do want to thicken up you know do some timber stand improvement bring in skip you know there's a reason we call him skip slide the habitat guy we're going to try to bring him in the next next week or two you guys got to see him do some work on his farm um, last week but bring him in, bring him in and get his opinion on some of this there's just certain pockets like this that are a little bit more open than than other areas on the farm we will make sure we're we're maximizing our timber as far as the habitat goes and, and creating brows and all that type of stuff the other thing that's interesting and mike and i may walk down to the end of the slough but you can see with all the snow melt and the rain we've got this slough is absolutely full and uh this is basically what we use for access on at least half of our hunts on this farm this past fall so we always talked about what would it look like if it was full and how would that change the deer movement so pretty interesting to see we may take a walk down and and see what it looks like at the head of it but just another one of those things that's going to force the deer movement in certain directions so pretty interesting it'll be really interesting to see yeah if it holds water because last year was such a drought i mean there wasn't an ounce of water on the entire farm every pothole pond was dry and so if we have a really wet spring and summer and these things hold water out into the deer season it's going to create more of a funnel effect which will be interesting and you know um we talked a little bit about food plots obviously that's a no-brainer this year we've got to get food in here um we can put a certain percent according to the contract into uh, food plots and so we've been strategizing about where we want to put food plots and um, we're going to have kind of a main hub as a general idea we're going to put a lot of acres five or six acres of one central kind of grain crop and then multiple like bow plots but and that's going to be right here where the the peninsula kind of comes out and that kind of goes into what we're going to do with TSI here. You know, this edge is really open right here. There's certainly some thick areas back there, but we're going to, one of our goals is going to be to create some sort of screen along this edge where the timber meets the field edge where we can have better access in and out and try to just make it more huntable uh, on a consistent basis. And going back to the, the food plots and the design of that, Mike and I have talked about that constantly because there's so many areas that where the deer bed it's it's really a challenge to come up with okay where can we strategically place these and create these to where we can hunt them you know time and time again and and have clean entry and exit so it'll be a learning year for sure you know yeah. we're, we're gonna make mistakes we're gonna have to give up uh, certain areas on spots but um, you know all we can do is try it and really just see how the food affects the, the deer movement and what we can and can't, can't get away with and in general, our plan as we move forward, you know, in the next few weeks of, of the off season, we're gonna start tackling these projects and we'll we'll get into a few more specifics on where we wanna put the plot and why we're putting it there or, you know, why we're doing TSI in a section like this. Um, but today we're just kind of introducing some of these topics that we wanna um, make changes and, and wanna do here in the next few weeks and we'll get into specifics uh, a little bit later. But we're gonna keep walking here. There's an area up here where we might create a plot. We're just going to kind of look around a little bit and keep making those decisions. So, Josh, we can use your canoe in the sweep. There you go. <laughs> Don't have to worry about the river. So this loop kind of peters out, but then that, you know, that big one that you filmed Rex bedded in is the one that goes out to where that big uh, maple is. All right. So like this, you know, there's gonna be that one ridge and then there'll be another low spot. It'll be interesting to see. You can see this little spot going across here too. Yeah, that little shoot right there. We're in a spot right now where we had a number of good encounters at the, we're at the head of the slough. We wanted to come see what the water looked like and it's kind of just filling in all the low spots and going going every which direction right here but there's a stand right here we we're calling this the head of the slough and mike and i both had some some really good hunts right here for that buck we call eli we haven't had camera or had pictures of him for quite a while but hopefully he made it we had you know created some pretty good history with him this fall throughout the hunts we learned that this is a major entrance and exit point for the uh for this peninsula that's a big bedding area and maybe not the exact entrance point, but where the stand is, you can almost see to the river on both sides. And so most of the deer coming in and out of here, you can see them from this spot and it just creates uh, some excellent hunting. And we've got some cameras sprinkled around here and we've got pictures of most of our mature bucks, you know, within a hundred yards of the stand yeah. at some point throughout uh, November. So, yeah. 
over time we'll just figure out a little bit more exactly how the deer move it. We've already been talking about where we should move this stand, if we should move it 50 yards down, but um, to create just, you know, get more on the funnel, so to speak, and create some better hunting. Here's one. Look at that. That's shed number two. I don't know shed on you. Know, <laughs> you know what deer that is? Yeah, I know what deer that is. <laughs> Old Rex. That's awesome. We couldn't shoot him, but at least we found him. Of all people to find that shed, you're probably the best one to walk up, <laughs> walk, right. walk up on that one. <laughs> five-year-old buck. That's the one awesome. five-year-old buck that's been on the cameras. That's the that's the buck we call Rex. That's uh, that's all Josh's too. old nemesis right there. We're all too familiar with it. A lot of close close calls. Josh about killed that deer a couple of different times, but that's cool. That's shed number two. We're just kind of we're not really shed on. We're just kind of walking walking across the edge here. Pretty close to that stand. I whistled at him. Just got done talking about how few of deer we've been seeing on trail camera, and now we found. Two sheds two. from the from bucks that we know pretty well. So two f five plus year old deer. That's pretty cool. We're actually at the the tree stand right now. The stand behind us is is where Josh had what maybe is the second to last encounter with Rex. We had another one when we made the trip uh, down the river. But this is a spot. So we talked about our first two goals being timber stand improvement and creating food plots and our, our third one is create better access trails and this is a spot right here that's fairly close to the back side of our property so if we want to hunt on the back side of this peninsula we have two options one go down the river like josh and i did or two we need to create some type of trail where we're not walking right through the middle of it there was a couple hunts where we did try to follow the slough and then cut across and it's just not ideal for you just walk through too much good prime bedding area so we're gonna try to get in here and do some mowing, do some pushing around, doze in the trail where we can have access to the backside of that property. And this is one of those spots where we wanna start. Yeah, certainly focusing on the perimeter. I mean, it makes sense to have clear trails around your perimeter, not only to access deer stands, but to retrieve game. And then over time we'll learn, you know, if we need to modify that. It'd be nice to have just a little network of trails in here. And there's a lot of deadfalls. And so I think we could do, um, make some pretty some trails fairly easily just by pushing out some of this debris and it's interesting to come in here right now and see where the water is you know there's there's not a lot of topography change but there's enough where all these low spots have two feet of water in them right now so it's good to see that and we can kind of flag out where we want to put these trails and then our fourth project or you know thing we want to do is just <clears throat> create more permanent tree stands again this tree stand that we're standing right next to it's actually our only permanent stand on the farm that we put up and left. We did a ton of hanging hunts <laughs> per usual, but landowner has some stands that, or the previous landowner, I should say, has some stands that that he left and that we, you know, did a little bit of hunting. But in general, we just did a lot of hang hunt because we didn't we didn't know where we wanted permanent stand. So that's project number four in the list. You know, going back and kind of fine tune some of these spots we hunted, had good encounters, learned the deer movement. Um, things like that. So that'll take some time. Obviously, we won't get that right the first time without a doubt It'll, it'll everything will change once we get food and stuff, but that's project number four. Yeah, so we're gonna have a busy off season. We're gonna mix in some uh, shed hunting and You know, obviously get pretty excited for this coming fall And like I said earlier, we'll, we'll as the weeks go on here this off season We'll dive into these four subjects and some more in, in a lot more detail um, I can't tell you how excited I am for these off-season projects to start. Even you know, even in November of last year, I was looking forward to this off-season just to, to get going and, and you know improve this place. So it'll be fun, and we'll we'll be sure to take you guys along here in the next couple months. I've got Jesse Randall with me today, and he's with the Iowa State Extension Office. Is that the Iowa State University Extension? It is Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Okay, and he's a forester with that program, and uh, we're talking about. Uh, burn plans and uh, coming up with a strategy for this farm and you know we do a lot of this habitat enhancement during the off season and one of the things that I've been shy about doing on this farm is burning we burned uh, switchgrass and some CRP but we've never burned in the timber so we're going to talk uh, today Jesse's going to do some scouting and some site selection but we're going to talk about two goals uh, one of them is just habitat improvement and uh, feeding more deer sure 
but uh, the other one is going to be uh, controlling invasives. And I've got a real problem on this farm with the bush honeysuckle. So that's one of the things that we'll address. We're not going to burn today, uh, but we're just going to give you a little bit of a heads up of what's going to be coming in some future episodes. So let's talk about real quick uh, what, what a site selection what would you know what would that look like for uh, habitat improvement what do you look for you know when you're when you're saying this would be a great place to burn what can we expect to come out of that from a you know a, a, a deer hunters or a, somebody who owns deer hunting land mm -hmm. you know what what advantages do we get from burning to focus on habitat and food sources sure I, I think it's important that that you work hand in hand with the landowner because they know the ground better than you do um, Fire is just one of those tools that we're going to put on the ground. And so when I'm out evaluating what I want to burn, one, I'm looking at what's in the understory already. Uh, I think we can use fire to really promote native browse, uh, make it edible, make it nutritious for the deer. I'm looking for seed sources up above. And so what we're looking for with fire is, is to put it on the ground and to get oaks to regenerate okay. from natural. So we need a seed source. But I'm also looking at the understory um, uh, shrubs mm -hmm. that uh, some of them are adapted to fire. And okay. so when we burn it off, they're going to sprout and the deer are going to eat them. Right. We're also looking at what we can control mm -hmm. for, for the invasives, the, the multiflora rose, the, the honeysuckle. Um, and even if we don't kill them on that first round, they're going to sprout too. Mm -hmm. and, and they're going to be nutritious. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we look to do this over two to three uh sequential burns that right. might be over the course of 10 years okay but for the first three years after a burn you're going to have a flush of new understory growth uh, okay. which is basically a, a salad bowl for deer we're, we're looking to get that leaf litter off yep. it's going to warm up the ground sooner in the spring mm -hmm. uh, and and over time you'll get more of a complex uh, salad bowl for them right. to eat so what will the fire kill and, and what I mean this gives them like not tons and tons of examples, but just sure. a few quick examples. Like I'm looking down, and I believe this is all coral berry. It is coral berry. So will deer or will the fire kill that? It's going to top kill it. Okay. And and it's going to it sprout back. Okay. Multiflora rose. we if we back burn it, it's going to kill the top, but not always the root system. Gotcha. And so we want to time the fire based off of what we're trying to kill and what we're not trying to kill. What are the things about this site that you like, and what are the things about it that you maybe you know think we could do better? So first off, you know, coming in on this trail, I'm looking at the logistics of how do we burn it? Uh, how easy is it going to be to burn? Yeah. Um, we don't want to put people in danger when we burn and, and people have a fear of fire. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at a beautiful fire break. Yeah. All right. And, and you have to think of timber burns. If, if we have flames that are a foot tall, we've done well. Mm -hmm. All right. That's mm -hmm. the level of flame we're having. So we have a beautiful fire break. We have a road with no power right. line on it. Right. And so really we're looking at ha only having to construct and, and protect one man-made fire break on the downhill side. Right. Um, I'm looking at topography because topography can overcome a lot of other variables. Uh, the, the steeper it is, the faster the fire may move up it if we start down below. Um, and so the logistics of this site work well. Okay, good. So this will be a good test for us. Uh, we're not gonna burn a whole bunch on the farm this year. We're just gonna pick one spot and uh, we're gonna do, like I said, one of each style of burn. Um, so, you know, we're gonna track this spot uh, over the next few months. And, and really, Jesse's gonna set the schedule for us. We're not gonna burn, like I said today, but we're gonna be coming back and, and doing this burn when it makes sense uh, from a forestry standpoint. But uh, then we can track it over the months and potentially even over the years and keep coming back to this location and saying, okay, three months ago we burned this. Here's what it looks like now. And here's a site adjacent to it that we didn't burn and you can see the difference and hopefully this, this creates a, an opportunity for you on your property. The thing that I, I took away from our discussion in my office was uh, um, how dangerous some of the unforeseen variables are. Mm -hmm. and, and Jesse was talking about the fact that electricity transmits through smoke and that if you burn under a power line, you can get zapped because it'll arc through the smoke to the ground. Yeah. And I thought, there's something that I never would have known. So we're going to give you a lot of, you know, we're not going to hopefully show you some of these worst case scenarios, but we're at least going to educate you on what are the precautions and, mm -hmm. and how to set up a burn plan without getting too deep into it. And sure. So we'll come back on this in a few weeks when the timing is right for Jesse and we'll dive into this a whole lot more. But I just wanted to give you a heads up that fire does serve a purpose. 
Uh, I have not been taking advantage of those opportunities and we're going to find out at least on a small level uh, what that looks like on my farm. So keep checking back on that and uh, you know Jesse's going to be pretty regular here for a few weeks and, and hopefully we can I can learn something and, and uh, hopefully you can learn something along the way too. On this next segment I'm going to be frost seeding this small food plot. This is a spot that I hunt a lot so I want to make sure I've got high quality food source here. It's surrounded by bedding areas. Uh, it's really I call them staging area food plots where the deer will come out feed you know right after they get out of their beds in the evenings and then they'll work their way out into the larger ag fields to feed for the night. So I want to make sure that these spots are good. I've got a number of them on the farm and frost seeding is really a great way to take care of this as long as you've got access to the bare dirt. You know, if you're trying to plant into something like grass or into some kind of weed competition, you're not going to do very well with frost seeding. You're going to have to wait and spray it and kill it and till it and, you know, start over again. But I've got pretty good access to the dirt here. So getting the seed down now, we've got a number of freeze and thaw cycles that are going to come over these next few weeks. And that's going to work this little small clover seed just a tiny little bit down into the top of the, of the soil. And that, that's where uh, clover does best. You don't want to plant that too deep. The shallower the better as long as you get some good seed to soil contact. So I'm planting uh, the Frigid Forage Pure Trophy Clover Blend and that's a blend of a number of different bra or a number of different clovers that you know should do well in just about any environment. So something out of just really do you know even if it's a little bit drier year or wetter year something in the blend will do really well. So I like blends better than planting just a pure strain of clover. So that's my plan for today. Uh, it's a good time of the year to be out frost seeding. So if you've got spots like this where you've got good access to the dirt. You know, you're not having to work down through the weed competition. Uh, frost seeding is really the very best way to plant your clover. Get it on top of the ground, let it work in. As soon as it warms up, you've got clover popping out of the ground. That's a good job to get finished up. I'll be back in here uh, probably within the next month on a good frozen day and uh, spread some fertilizer on this plot. Clover likes P and K fertilizer and we're going to dive into a lot more of this discussion about fertilizers and what to put on your food plots, but we have a, a plenty of more off-season uh, topics that we're going to cover. We've got obviously the burn um, that we're going to be doing here. We're going to do a lot of shed antler hunting, more of this food plot work, uh, tons of talk about different bucks that we've hunted and hopefully some, some deer hunting strategies along the way. So keep checking back on the Midwest Whitetail off-season. Well, I appreciate you joining me. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.